Amen. You may be seated and let's pray together. Father, the truth is, there are days that we look forward to the time when our faith will, in fact, be sight and we'll be home. We thank you, God, that in the meantime, while you've called us to be in this world, you've given us your Spirit who indwells every believer and guides us in all truth. And so we're thankful. We would pray now, Lord, that as we again take the time to look at the truth of your word, that our hearts would be open to it. Help us not just to listen to yet another sermon, but help us to have our eyes and our hearts opened to your truth. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Dr. Steve Brown is one of my preaching heroes. I love him for the insight that he brings to preaching through the way that he thoughtfully approaches the biblical text. But I also appreciate his ministry so very much because he is, if I can just put it this way, he is so very real. Not long ago, I heard Dr. Brown talking about how Scripture affects him. This is what he said, and I quote, He said, I was recently asked to preach on Psalm 23, and while working on the sermon, I noticed something new. I felt good working on it. There are, of course, propositional and doctrinal truths in that psalm, but I discovered that God designed Psalm 23, along with a lot of other psalms and a good deal of Scripture, to move my heart as much as my head. In other words, God's Word isn't designed just to give us a list of facts. Along with the facts, God speaks deeply to our hearts. The result isn't just a simple affirmation of the facts, but also something that goes far deeper. God designed His Word to appeal to our emotions. I know whenever I read some passages in the Bible, I feel great. I mean, they make me feel good. Others, when I read them, I feel convicted. Can I get a witness? When I read Revelation 21 about the new heaven and the new earth and how God will wipe away every tear, I always tear up because I think about my parents who are now in heaven. When I read Amos, and by the way, I'm trying to read the book several times a week these days, and that's a great practice, I have a lot of different feelings when I read it. I feel convicted. I'm sad when I read it. I'm sad for the people of Amos' day. I'm sad for the people of our day. And then I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because God is so very patient. I'm hopeful because God offers the possibility of repentance. So we continue like a roaring lion as we move through the book of Amos. We're in Amos chapter 5, and we will begin reading with the very first verse. We'll read three verses as we stand together, please, for the reading of God's Word. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin Israel forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Amos, you'll recall, is what we refer to as a minor prophet. And bear in mind, it's considered minor not because of what it says, but rather because of the length. It is short, compared to what we refer to as major prophets like the book of Isaiah. Remember, there are 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. How many minor prophets? We have Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So we have 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament, and we have five major prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. How many Major prophets are there? Five. During our time in this minor prophet, so far we've taken some time to introduce the book. Then we've dealt with the seven judgment speeches against the nations from chapter 1 and part of chapter 2. 
And then we worked through the transitional judgment speech against Israel in chapter 2. And then we talked about the first two of three judgment speeches against Israel. And this morning, we will be concluding the third judgment speech. I appreciate, by the way, the candor with which so many of you have talked with me concerning Amos. A lot of people have been open with me in saying they've not read the book, or if they have, they would say I've, it's been kind of a, a cursory reading. They felt as though understanding the book was really difficult. I get that, and I appreciate the honesty. That's why at the beginning we talked about how, unlike other books in the Bible, things like Paul's letters or the Gospels or other historical books, there's a bridge, and in fact, it's a wide bridge, if you will, that we have to cross in order to gain proper understanding of what Amos is actually communicating. While we understand, for example, Jesus' words about sparrows and counting the cost and loving others, Amos' words about Bethel and Gilgal and cows of Bashan need a little more explanation. So that's what we're striving to do in our time together. Remaining in this book are two woe oracles against Israel, five judgment visions against Israel, and then finally we'll conclude with, this is the good news, two salvation promises extended for Israel. So there's light at the end of the tunnel, and I don't think it's a train. We know that Amos is a very gloomy book in many ways. There's a lot of talk about sin or transgression. There's a lot of talk about God's judgment. Remember that God's people, God's people, not the world, God's people were not striving to live in proper fellowship with Him. These were His covenant people, and they wanted the benefits of the covenant promises. They wanted the blessings from the hand of God. They just did not want to be obedient to God. So Amos, a man who is not a professional prophet by trade, comes on the scene in the 8th century B.C. to announce that God's judgment is coming on the people of God. So we have four points to get to, but first, one brief detour. God is meticulous about how His Word is constructed. That's the detour. God is meticulous about how His Word is constructed. We've talked about this before, and it may not seem important, but in fact, I think that it is. We pastors sometimes talk about things that some people really don't care about. For the record, I want you to know, I know that. In other words, we may think something is a big deal, but unless there's some connection to your life on Monday, a lot of people may think that it doesn't deserve the attention that we might, in fact, give to it on a Sunday. This may be one of those things, but there is a reason for me bringing this to your attention. We've talked about what is known as a chiasm or chiastic structure in literature, particularly in the Bible, even more particularly in the Old Testament. So give me about 60 seconds and then we're going to move on. And if this is not your thing, this is your time to take a quick nap. Your neighbor will nudge you when the minute is up. But I have a reason for bringing it to your attention. Take a look at what we have on the screen. Now remember, chiasm is the structure where the first and the last lines, or the first and the last phrases, mirror one another, and then the second, and the second to the last, and then the third, and the third to the last, etc. And then you have a standalone phrase or sentence in the middle. Look at that for a moment, because you see the order and the beauty and the symmetry there. Here's why this is so beautiful, and here's why this is such a big deal. It speaks to the order and the beauty and the, just the way God's Holy Spirit superintended the writing of the Scripture and putting it all together. You've heard through the years pastors utilize the words inerrant and infallible. This is at some level connected to those concepts, meaning God not only saw to it that everything in the Word was what He wanted in the Word, but even the attention to detail that is demonstrated in something like chiasm in a text like this was put there on purpose by God's creative hand. This is, in fact, and it happens over and over again in different places, this is a literary masterpiece. It's not the only time this occurs. My point is, God not only cares about what He says in His Word, He cares about how it is said as well. And I, for one, think that's worth noting. Well, that took more than 60 seconds. But I trust you'll forgive me. And uh, if you will, I'll let you out early next week. And if you believe that, you probably thought the Ford Pinto was a good idea. 
So now to the heart of the matter. First of all, I want you to recognize the people of God should lament over disobedience. The people of God should lament over disobedience. We read verses 1 through 3 of Amos 5 just a moment ago. Lament is not a word that we hear very often, certainly not a word that we use very often. While there may certainly be some variation in terms of shades of meaning or nuances in definitions, essentially lament means to mourn, it means to grieve, it means to express sorrow. Sometimes lamenting even takes on a very vocal expression with weeping and wailing occurring. Just as there are cultural norms in our day for grieving, there were cultural norms in the 8th century B.C. for grieving as well. The point is that God's people should lament over disobedience. Here, Amos is going to do something that he has not done in the other judgment speeches. He will lament as well as denounce. He will lament, he will grieve, as well as denounce. The things he says are urgent, but as he has done in other places, he will not be sarcastic at any point here. He will mention the possibility of being rescued from the judgment of God. We get this from both verse five or verse six as well as verse fifteen. Chapter five, verse six, part A, seek the Lord and live, and then verse fifteen, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This lamentation of Amos is comprised of short, and some scholars will even note almost sobbing lines. He is lamenting. Israel is depicted as a virgin. This could denote the idea of previous innocence as well as vulnerability. It carries with it the idea of youthfulness as well as perhaps purity. It also depicts the notion, if you will, of a young maiden who had her whole life before her and the opportunity for years of love and faithfulness were just ahead. Fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin Israel, Amos says. Fallen, in the Old Testament, usually is a reference to someone who has died tragically. Typically, this is not a reference to someone who dies more naturally from old age or even diseases that simply come with old age. This lament is a funeral song. It's a dirge sung over the deceased. Singing this funeral song about Israel, as Amos does, is an implication, it's an indication that Israel is either dead or at the very least dying. The key here is that we see the genuine concern that Amos has for the people of God. Amos will lament over their disobedience. The people of God, I submit to you, ought to always lament over disobedience. That was true in the days of Amos, and that is true in our days as well. We certainly would all agree there are a lot of things in terms of the state of affairs in our world over which we could grieve, right? When I think about situations in our world, even in our very own nation, it grieves me. In fact, I think we're facing civil unrest like none that we faced, at least in my lifetime. We're dealing with rampant sin. And to make matters worse now, to make it even worse, now people in official places of leadership are calling on the citizenry of our country to simply look the other way at lawlessness. Let me explain. I read an article just last week that, that uh, detailed how a district attorney in California says that police officers have to consider if people looting stores need the property they're stealing before they can charge them with a crime. So not only do police officers now have to protect and serve, they also have to be psychologists, or they have to play the role of God to get inside someone's heart and mind and understand why it is they're doing what they're doing. Do you have any idea what an absolute mockery of justice that is? Am I the only one that thinks that's ridiculous? So if someone says they need your car or your house or your wallet or your wife, they can take what they want because they need it, and that's okay. 
Last week, our staff heard a presentation on human sex trafficking. The way that a perpetrator gains access to a child, the meticulous way that bad people go about the task of targeting vulnerable kids, it is absolutely gut-wrenching. It makes me sad, and it makes me angry at the same time. But listen carefully. We should, as believers, grieve over the way the world is going, but we should be equally as grieved over not just the sin of the world, but the sin of the people of God. That's the point Amos is making here. Now, I could elaborate on this, but I think it best to let the Spirit of God do what He does best. I learned a long time ago He can convict people of sin much better than we can, right? When I hear a believer, someone who says they're a Christian, when I hear a Christian say they're in favor of something that we know the Scripture is clearly against, we ought to lament. And we ought to lament because ignoring or twisting the Scripture to fit our mindset, and even in some cases to fit our politics, is in fact a form of disobedience. True? I think what Paul Washer said really fits well at this point. He said, people tell me, judge not, lest ye be judged. I always tell them, twist not Scripture, lest ye be like Satan. The people of God should lament over disobedience. Secondly, the people of God should hold out hope. The people of God should hold out hope. Verse 4 and following. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, and do not enter into Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. The people of God should hold out hope. There is a conditional promise that is offered here. Israel could survive if the people of God would seek the Word of God from the prophet of God. So the point is not just to hold out hope. The truth of the matter is there are people all over the world that are placing their hope in something or some things, but we as the people of God ought to hold out hope as we seek the Lord there is still going to be an opportunity to repent, even though Israel has, in fact, messed up royally. They turn justice to wormwood. That's a picture of how perverted their so-called justice had become. Does that resonate with anybody? It was so bad, he likens it to an herb that was known for its bitterness. They turn justice to bitterness. That speaks volumes about what the Lord thought concerning their views and their practice of justice. These days, we have people who will fight harder to save a rainforest than a baby. What do you think God thinks about that? Notice, if you will, that the people are called upon not to seek some activity connected with a spiritual site like Bethel or Gilgal, but rather to seek Yahweh, to seek God, to seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and live, Amos says. So I want you to recognize, if you will, that refuge is not found in some spiritual guru. The answers to life's questions won't suddenly appear on the wailing wall in Jerusalem. The help that we human beings need will come, as the Scripture reminds us over and over and over again, my help comes, writes the psalmist in Psalm 121, verse 2, from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You need help? Seek God. I said last week how careful I want to be as I preach. 
I recognize, please understand, I recognize that Amos did not have 21st century America in mind when he was preaching to the northern kingdom in the 8th century B.C., but I think, I think that it is safe to extrapolate here an ancillary principle from the Scripture, to wit, don't seek God in a person, place, or movement. Seek God, period. Don't seek God in a person, place, or movement. Seek God, period. And if God shows up within the ministry of a person or in a place or in a movement, that's fine. But do not let the person or the place or the movement become in some way your object of worship. We should seek the Lord, seek God, period. I have a lot of preachers that have blessed my life through the years. I quote Dr. Adrian Rogers and Dr. Steve Brown a lot. They've impacted me tremendously in my walk with Jesus. I love to listen to Alistair Begg, the senior pastor at the Parkside Church in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. He is one of God's gifts to the modern church. But listen carefully. I watch these men and I listen to these men of God in whatever places they're in for the sole purpose of seeking God. I don't need another hero. I need a connection to God. I've known a lot of people who have been enamored with a lot of different preachers through the years. I know a lot of people who have been enamored with Pastor John Hagee through the years. Now, if you don't want your pastor to be ugly, just tune me out for a minute. About 25 years ago, I pastored a couple that told me they sent John Hagee their tithe. They talked about how wonderful he was. Now, if you don't know it, John Hagee is one of those preachers. He says a lot of really good things. I'm not going to take that away. But if you don't know it, he's also one of those preachers who can read a text of Scripture and explain it in such a way that everybody thinks he has a better connection to heaven than anybody else. A lot of people think he's really deep because he sees things in the Bible nobody else sees. Well, let me just say, if a man sees things in the Bible nobody else sees, I think it's time to question what it is he's seeing. Hagee said, for example, at one point that the Jewish people were on an entirely different track to salvation than the rest of us. It was back in the late 1980s when he said that. They get a second chance, according to Pastor Hagee, after the fact that the rest of the world doesn't get. And while I may not see things in the Bible nobody else sees, I've seen enough to know what John Hagee says at that point isn't right. Jesus, speaking to a bunch of Jews, said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Boom. So this couple loved John Hagee. They sent me his books. Pastor, did you read the book? No, I was reading the Bible. They asked me about every week whether or not I watched him. They wanted to know if I had heard his latest proclamation about Israel or the second coming, and if I knew how he was such good friends with whomever happened to be leading a political party at that particular juncture. My point is don't seek a man. Don't seek a place. Don't seek a movement. Seek God. I told this couple, whom I dearly loved, by the way, I said, listen, next time you're in the hospital, don't call me. Call John Hagee and see if he'll come visit you in the middle of the night. I did. You're wondering, I know. I'm just going to clear that up. These are difficult days. And there's a lot of unrest, I know. Anarchy is taking the place of the rule of law in some places, in some cities. There are racial tensions, and there are religious tensions, and there are political tensions. We're going to be reminded next week of the famous phrase of Amos as he says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made that phrase a household sentence in his famous I have a dream speech when he said so powerfully, and I quote, no, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And nobody could have said it like him, except maybe Amos. We can hold out hope because one day, listen to me, one day, justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. 
The people of God should lament over disobedience. The people of God should hold out hope. Thirdly, the people of God should recognize the sovereignty of God. The people of God should recognize the sovereignty of God. Look with me, please, at verses 8 and 9. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is His name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. The people of God should recognize the sovereignty of God. This is a picture of power. This is a picture of ruler. This is a picture of God being king over the world, over the earth, over the universe. And God's people in Amos' day, just like God's people in our day, need a reminder that God is, in fact, sovereign. This is a picture of God's sovereignty over the constellations and over the seasons and over the way light and darkness vary with the changing seasons. So pretty soon when we move into fall and the leaves begin to change and it starts to get dark a little earlier, you ought to look up and say, that's the handiwork of God. It's the sovereignty of God as He rules over all of creation. So here's a thought. You name whatever it is you're up against this very moment, you think about whatever's bugging you, whatever hurt you feel, whatever heartache you're dealing with, you think about something that is really troubling you right now in this very moment. If God is king, if He is sovereign over the stars and the seasons and the light and the darkness and the rain and the drought... Is it possible He is sovereign over your life too? So, the people of God should lament over disobedience. The people of God should hold out hope. The people of God should recognize the sovereignty of God. Fourthly and finally, the people of God should prepare for God's judgment. The people of God should prepare for God's judgment. Look with me, please, beginning at the 10th verse. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice at the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing And in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. And in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. The people of God should prepare for God's judgment. You recognize that in antiquity, decisions that needed judgment were taken to the gate of the city. The elders and other heads of families would assemble there to judge disputes and to mete out justice. The city gate would have a space on the inner side with rooms or alcoves in the gate area itself that would be used as the equivalent of courtrooms in our day and age. Notice verse 10 one more time. They hate him who reproves 
in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Among the things Amos is condemning is the very contempt that the people had against the very people charged with guarding the welfare of the social and legal aspects of Israel. Does that sound strangely familiar? That people, people would despise the very people who are supposed to keep the laws and take care of justice? Well, thank God that'll never happen in America, right? Amos is condemning the people because they've been greedy. They charge tenant farmers too much for land use, and in many cases, it's very likely the land was essentially stolen from its rightful owners in the first place. Amos, speaking for God, reminds the people that God knows their transgressions and how they harm the righteous, how they ignore the needy, and how they are, in fact, prone to take a bribe. But then in verse 14, there's that hope again. Hope if the people would seek good and not evil. And in the very last verse for today, verse 17, look at it again. And in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. No question, no question that is reminiscent of the Passover and how God brought judgment on those who did not follow His command. It's a fearful thing to disobey a holy God. And God's people should prepare for judgment. There was an anonymous guy that shared a story of how school was just starting that's appropriate for us this week. He wrote, One morning I went out to start the car because I was going to go to church. I had a flat tire. Luckily, I had a spare. I changed the tire quickly and went on my way. I didn't think to drop off the other tire to be fixed. I'll get around to it, I thought. Just a couple of days later, I got in my car to go to school and another flat tire. Only this time, there was no spare. I had to take off the flat tire, take it to the gas station, and wait while it was fixed. So what's the takeaway? What's the big deal? What's the lesson? The lesson is, don't wait until something happens to be prepared. In the case of our dealings with God, don't wait until judgment comes to think you can be prepared. Prepare now. As the old adage goes, there is literally no time like the present. Would you pray with me, please? Father, the words of Amos, which we believe to be your words, are strong and they're harsh. At times they're condemning, and yet they're still an offer of hope if we would but seek you. And so, God, this morning... We don't pray just for our world and we don't pray just for our nation as important as we know it is to pray for these peoples. God, we pray for the people of God to seek you. I would also, God, be remiss if I didn't pray this morning for those in this place that perhaps have been counting on a person or a place or a thing to be made right with you. Remind us again that we are to seek you and you have told us that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to shed his life's blood as a sacrifice in our place that we might be saved. So Father, I pray for every person in this room, every person who is watching, every person who is listening, And I would ask that if they have never done it, that today would be the day they repent of their sin and they place their faith 
in the Lord Jesus alone in order to be saved. Help us, God, to prepare that way. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me remind you that at the conclusion of our worship this morning, some of our staff will be here at the front. If you'd like for someone to explain more about Jesus to you, or maybe you'd like to join our church, or you need to follow Christ through the waters of believers' baptism, maybe you want to be prayed for or prayed with, whatever the case might be, at the conclusion of our time this morning, we would love to help you in your walk with Christ.